So guys, what do you want to explore this week? Sleep apnea. Does anyone know anything about sleep apnea? No. Maybe we should contact an expert in the field. We could go to the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health at St. Joe's. That's a great idea. Yeah. Field trip! Seat belts, everyone! Please let this be a normal field trip with a friend. No way! Cruising on down Main Street, you're relaxed and feeling good. Come to the Magic School of the Alligator Nostrum. Climb on the Magic School of Stanley. Hi, Stanley. Uh, so I have a series of questions for you. Uh, sure. The first one is, what is sleep apnea? Okay, so it, sleep apnea is when the back of the tongue and the back of the throat come together when you're sleeping. Normally when you're sleeping, your back of the tongue and the throat are apart like this, but in people who have sleep apnea, that comes together like that, and that stops your breathing. And, a, and apnea is a Greek word meaning stoppage of breathing. The second question I have for you is how common is sleep apnea? Well, sleep apnea is defined as a, the number of stoppages in an hour being five or more. And if you use that definition, it's probably about 10% uh, of adults. And it varies from population to population because one of the, the most important things that causes sleep apnea is obesity. So the more obese the population is, the more likely the people are to have sleep apnea. Okay, so the third question I have for you is, um, how do I know if I have sleep apnea? The classic sort of picture that people have of someone who has sleep apnea is someone who snores and stops breathing and is restless at night. But not everyone who does have sleep apnea actually snores, and they're not always restless. And they, you don't always see or it's not known that they have stoppages in their breathing. So. The other thing that happens is that people who have sleep apnea often have unrefreshing sleep. So they wake up in the morning and they don't feel that they've slept well. Mm -hmm. So if you sleep for a normal amount of time and you wake up and you don't feel refreshed, there's something wrong with your sleep. The other symptoms of sleep apnea are sweating at night, headaches in the morning. And in the daytime, in addition to sort of being tired and fatigued, sleep apnea can cause problems with memory, concentration and focus and can also give you problems with your emotional state, so you can become depressed and anxious or irritable or paranoid or anything, okay? So how do we diagnose sleep apnea? Classically, you take a patient and put them in the sleep lab, and in the sleep lab, they sleep, they're wired up with electrodes to their head so we can tell what stage of sleep they're in. We have electrodes on their face, around their eyes to their chin to help us determine whether they're in dreaming or non-dreaming sleep. We put bands around the chest and the abdomen to uh, look at breathing movements. And we put an oximeter on the finger which measures the oxygen levels in the blood. So from those measurements we get an estimate of sleep stage, sleep state, whether, how sleep, whether it's disrupted or not. We know how many stoppages of breathing there are, and we know the consequences of those stoppages of breathing in terms of whether or not the blood oxygen levels are going down. So what are the, some uh, treatment options for those who are diagnosed with sleep apnea? Well, if you think that the problem with sleep apnea is the back of the tongue coming together, and this is a collapsible area. So what happens is we put a CPAP mask on, a mask that provides constant air, air pr pressure over the nose. The air comes down through the nose into the back of the pharynx and prevents the collapse. So the airway is held open and you don't snore and you don't have stoppages in breathing. So that's called CPAP treatment. And that's the standard treatment for patients who have sleep apnea, unless there is a different reason for them having the sleep apnea, something that can be fixed, okay? So for instance, if we look at you, your bottom jaw is set back a bit. So you have what we call retronathia, backward displacement of the jaw. And what happens is the backward displacement of the jaw takes your tongue closer to the back of the throat, so it makes it narrower. 
Yeah. So you've got a setup for having sleep apnea. So don't catch yourself overweight because you're going to get sleep apnea wow. for sure. Oh, wow. okay? <laughs> so one of the other treatments is that we actually use dental devices to pull the bottom jaw forward. So people sleep with these devices and with their jaw pulled forward. The tongue is pulled forward because it's attached to the back of the mandible so that opens the airway up. What's the typical prognosis um, for sleep apnea? So we treat sleep apnea for two reasons. One is because of symptoms. So if someone's really sleepy and tired in the daytime, then they're at increased risk of accidents, both motor vehicle accidents, industrial accidents. So one prognosis for someone who's excessively sleepy is that they don't, they, they're at in, increased risk of injury or death accidentally. If you think about a child or a young person who's in school and they're excessively sleepy or tired, they don't function well at school. So they lose out on an education. They, lose, they, they don't do as well education. And I had one young woman who, until she developed sleep apnea, was a grade A student and her parents came along frustrated because she was getting C's, she was failing. Yeah. You know? We also treat sleep apnea if it's severe enough because we believe it has an increased risk of heart attack and stroke. And that's when we have what we call severe sleep apnea, which is when the number of stoppages of breathing per hour, that so-called apnea index, is greater than 30. So we try and treat people to prevent them having a health outcome risk, bad, bad health outcome. So the last question I want to ask you is, um, as an expert in the field, do you have any last minute uh, concerns that you also want to express about, about this uh, condition? Well, thank you for asking that question because, in fact, I do. I think that we've talked about people being symptomatic, what the symptoms are of sleep apnea, but I think as we see more patients who come to us not because they're symptomatic but because they're coming because of bariatric surgery and things like that, we're beginning to understand that there are a lot of people who can have severe sleep apnea and it's not symptomatic. And if you're not symptomatic, unless someone screens you for the condition, you're not going to find it. So one of our challenges actually, knowing that there are a large number of people out there at risk for severe sleep apnea who, and who are not currently diagnosed and treated, is do we have a, a screening test which is easy to apply for these people so we can actually try and avoid them being at risk for heart attack and stroke. So thank you, Dr. Pulse, for your time today. You're welcome. And uh, we've learned a lot from you, and thank you again. Well, spread the message. <laughs> Come on, right?